Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be doing part 6 of the Extra History series on Otto von Bismarck. And this is the finale. Dude. I'm pretty hyped right now. Um, it's kind of short compared to the others. Well, most of them are nine to 10 minutes, uh, maybe closer to 11 minutes on some of them. Uh, this one is shy of seven minutes and we're wrapping things up. So, okay, we're, we, we're getting United Germany, like for real, I guess. Uh, I, I would love to know the implications of that. I mean, I guess I get them in relation to uh, World War One. that's been like the only lens through which I've ever really looked at the early United Germany, but uh, I'm curious to how they're going to, what moral are we gonna take away from this if there is one? Or, uh, or what are they gonna focus on after taking us on this rather interesting journey? So let's get started. The Prussian army reigned victorious. A quarter of a million men had surrendered to them, and the French emperor was their prisoner. It was time to make peace. There was only one problem. What was the problem? <laughs> you can't just hit me with an intro like that. You see, capturing an emperor sounds great. It sounds like the thing that happens when you win. But when the emperor is the state, and he's also your prisoner, who do you negotiate with? This was the problem Bismarck oh, was facing. Yeah. Too much winning. He wanted to make peace, but they had won so much that he couldn't figure out who to make peace with. So when the news reached Paris on- I guess in this case, what would you, you- If you had the emperor, you'd probably just have to go in with like complete force in a lot of cases, and they don't want to do that. So yeah, that, that's kind of mind boggling. I'm not sure. On September 2nd, 1870, one of the remaining generals and a few French statesmen declared themselves the government, which they cleverly named the Government of National Defense. Of course, the emperor was... I mean, generals make sense, I guess. Like, they have the army, so yeah, it, it makes sense that they would step in. I mean, yeah, I guess you gotta wait for... Uh them to find to build a sort of structure that you can negotiate with which f this feels kind of silly when you think about this you could turn this into a monty python sketch uh i'm not even going to try to make a bit out of this i was tempted to i'm not funny enough to make that happen though technically still alive and hadn't ever abdicated which was a complication also they hadn't been elected not a lot so of legitimacy, where did their legitimacy there come from well, yeah, everybody basically thinking. agreed, nowhere. I said that, This too. slapdash government maintained some same semblance of control by delivering strong speeches about how France wouldn't give up an inch of territory, to which Bismarck responded, Uh-huh. Alsace and Lorraine, please. Negotiations with this pseudo-government <laughs> quickly fell apart. Moltke was pretty stoked. This meant he would get to march on Paris after all. As the Prussians so, yeah, approached force. the French capital, the government of national defense recalled all of France's armed forces from their colonies, their holdings in Italy, and summoned them to the defense of the homeland. Soon they had a formidable force at Paris, at least on paper, and they began to dig in. But Moltke simply surrounded the capital and laid siege to it. One of the main members of the government As of you national do. defense pieced out via air balloon to see if he could raise an army in Loire. Every that is a, a quite French thing to do, <laughs> to piece off in an air balloon. Okay. Um, yeah, that that's, uh, and, and he's a threat on the outskirts. I, I'm assuming he's not going to be that much more of a threat since we only have uh, a few more minutes left in this series. But, like, it, it would be funny if that guy came back and became a thing. Everybody else stayed put, defenses raised, just waiting for Moltke to try to storm the city. Moltke had no intention of doing something so blindingly wasteful, though. Instead, Damn. he planned to simply let Paris starve and wait them out while the rest of Germany's forces patrolled France, crushing As whatever other armies the French put in the field. Bismarck argued that they should shell the city, something that Moltke and the general staff felt was inhumane against Listen the to rules Moltke. of war and uh, he seems to know what he's doing. anyway. But as time wore Everything on, he does Wilhelm is good. got impatient with the rising costs of this siege and ordered Moltke to listen to Bismarck. You're there taking much debate France. About of course it's going to cost a lot. You you are about to like totally like 
beat France. You have them. They they are they are beat. You just have to like maintain this a little bit. Oh, getting in pay. I, like I understand it's expensive, but it's like a victory of the century how much effect the guns had, and whether it was the shelling or just the starvation that led to surrender, but at last, the government of national defense signed an armistice. During these peace negotiations, the representative of the government of national defense pleaded with Bismarck, saying that if Paris acceded to all demands, it would cause a socialist revolution. Bismarck coolly replied, then I recommend provoking an uprising now while you still have an army to crush it. Outplayed at every turn, the government of national defense gave Bismarck basically everything he wanted. He got Alsace Sick. and Lorraine with nearly 1,700 villages and towns, adding a million and a half new souls to the German Empire. He got 5 billion francs in gold to be paid as indemnity, and Prussian troops would be staying in France until that was paid. Just in So, um... There's a pretty good reason, it seems now. Uh, this real, this one episode specifically um, really highlights why uh, France and uh, the British were afraid of a uh, united Germany. Uh, this makes it as clear as anything. Uh, this was quite the the stomping from the looks of it like and it, it totally makes sense and the fact that they cracked down on france so hard it kind of makes a little sense like uh, oh i guess the uh the french did not forget later on they they there's definitely a little bit of a, a historical tension there that might uh inspire them to uh crack down in the other direction when uh the tables are turned like it, it all kind of makes sense once it starts once you get the fuller context of things and i'm, I'm really happy that i've gotten through this series and uh and and am getting said context. In case some real French government came along and tried to go back on their deal. Oh, and also, Bismarck got a German empire. More specifically, he forced the French to Good officially acknowledge Wilhelm as Kaiser, or Emperor, of Germany, the last real step in the unification process. Back when the war first started, the southern German states, the last holdouts, had sort of been absorbed into this growing entity which Bismarck had been putting together. During the war, citizens of Baden or Bavaria or Württemberg had fought side by side with Prussians. It had given them a sense of unity and brotherhood that eclipsed their regional differences, made them an army of Germans fighting together. So now, as the war wound to a close, after experiencing such a great victory through cooperation, these states all voted to become part of something greater, something called the German Empire. Finally, in a scene full of spectacle and drama. That's kind of encouraging. Um, imperialism is generally a dirty word when it comes to me. I, I'm, not, I'm not a huge fan of that sort of thing, but when it is uh, so unanimous when people start coming together, like, if this were, like, the North conquers the South, and I'm just like, I'd be like, eh, I don't know. I'm not as huge a, a fan of that. That's not how I would have wanted it to go down, but this is, uh, this is kind of nice. I mean, I wish we could have avoided that uh, the whole conflict with France, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I kind of like the uh, the national unity that came from this because you don't always get that. It, things don't usually go that smoothly when you have uh, different peoples coming together. Right. The German Empire. Finally, in a scene full of spectacle and drama, on January 18th, 1871, the leading military commanders declared Wilhelm Kaiser in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. And so the glory of war and the pomp and circumstance of imperial dignity played out. Now all that was left was creating a constitution, which Bismarck expedited by convincing like the a newly formed German Empire to simply adopt most of northern Germany's previous constitution. But with one interesting proviso, all ministries were under the office of chancellor, and the chancellor could propose legislation or bring things to debate in any of the parliamentary houses. But the chancellorship itself was granted at the direct pleasure of the king. No other body could remove a chancellor or appoint one. Coin Ooh, that, 
That sounds like a mess to me. Like, I... I, I know I live in a country where it's like notoriously hard to remove somebody even if they uh, do something like totally wrong, but that uh, that sounds a little bit too powerful, <laughs> but like, I, I don't know. How'd it work out? We'll see, I guess. Coincidentally, Bismarck just so happened to be the Chancellor of Germany, but oh, even yeah. with this oh, yeah, broad power over his newly formed empire, even now that he was finally ascendant in Germany and Europe at large, Bismarck now faced a challenge that he had never truly had to deal with before, the challenge of governing. Most of Bismarck's life had been focused on unification, on expansion, and on foreign policy. Hmm. He'd never before yeah. really had that to focus on yeah. questions of domestic policy for Germany. A new Germany, one sewn together out of disparate people of different backgrounds and different faiths. And here, perhaps, would be his greatest challenge, because now he had to ensure the continued meteoric rise of this new German empire, while at the same time fending off the jealousies of Europe's existing great powers, so that they didn't band together and crush this fledgling nation. This Herculean effort would take him the rest of his life, and for all of its difficulties, would be the triumph of his foreign policy and his political philosophy of revolutionary conservatism. But if Bismarck had one great failing, one true tragedy to his life... Before he does his, like, final statement on this, like, yeah, that could be a whole series in itself, probably, how he governed up until the final years of his life. Like, this whole thing has been... Uh, imperialistic and like based on uh, a lot of military a lot of building up to military conflict but yeah we have not seen a lot of governing from him and i i would like to learn a little bit more about that i don't know if we have any uh other videos on bismarck that you want me to check out but of course you let me know in the comments if you do know uh anything that maybe stuff that isn't exactly covered in this or isn't covered in as great a depth in this because like I'm, I'm down with learning some more about the guy i it's gonna be weird to if i were to just let him go from here and have this be the end of it i i feel like there's more of a story to learn but if Bismarck had one great failing, one true tragedy to his life, it would be that he could not envision a world without Bismarck. At least not until it was far too late. And so oh, all of this no. effort, all of this work he did to ensure a strong but peaceful future for Germany would wash away in other leaders' hands, feeding directly into the looming catastrophes of 1914. But that's a story for another time. Thanks for watching. And we and it links to the seminal tragedy, of course. Uh, and we did that series uh, uh, not that long ago, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it, it it was a good one too, and and that that one got me feeling emotions. So I'm not sure exactly what I'm gonna do next. I I might continue and just. Uh, I might pick one at random. I might do a poll. I, I'm not really sure at this point. I think by the time this video comes out, by the time you're seeing this, I will have already determined what series I'm going to be doing next by them. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. We'll see what future me ends up finding out. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this series. I really loved it. I'm glad I was able to wrap up these past uh, four episodes kind of in this in this one sitting. I've done them all in this one sitting. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think these are a lot of fun to take on kind of in bulk. Uh, I feel like when I take so much time in, be in, in between episodes, I have to either go back and watch them again and refresh myself or, like, I'm kind of on the edge of my seat wishing I knew what happened because, like, it's hard to be left... Uh, with uh, a craving for knowledge unfulfilled, and I, I guess that's one of the fun things that I've been able to experience with this channel. Uh, constantly being able to push to learn new things that are outside of what I would normally learn uh, in class or in my private studies or whatever. I, I think that I'm, I'm happy with the direction that this channel has gone, and since I've gone to uh, try to learn things that I don't know rather than talk about just the things that I do know, I, I think I've benefited so much from this. Uh, 
And this is a great introduction to Bismarck, and I understand that it is only an introduction. I'm sure I have plenty more to learn about him and the period, and uh, there's so much uh, culturally I'm curious about with this. So uh, we'll see when or uh, I was going to say if, but definitely when I get back to uh, taking a look at Germany again, because there's definitely uh, a lot to learn there. So thanks for watching, and I will see you guys tomorrow with another video.